Good morning again and welcome to session three of the Better Investor Conference. Now many people want to manage investment portfolios, portfolios but it's difficult. Uh, you know, they, they want to create discretionary portfolios and build wealth and uh, they see it as a way for, to put money at work, especially surplus money. And skin in the game as part of a learning journey is always, always a great idea. But it's not always easy to construct a portfolio that beats the market. In fact, many professional investors also battle to do that. Uh, and, and many investors make critical mistakes which could have been avoided. And today I'm gonna to talk to two professional investors. We want to hear what their investment philosophies are, how they approach markets, how they formulate their strategies, and uh, what they are thinking about what is happening currently, uh, not only in South Africa, but all around the world. And uh, we would like to hear where they see opportunities, uh, what they regard as challenges, and uh, I think uh, hearing from professional investors can guide many amateur investors to become better investors. I've got two guests uh, today, Senzo Langa, he's head of portfolio management, Alexander Forbes, or Alex Forbes these days, and uh, he's been in that position for more than five years. He has been in the asset management industry for more than 11 years. He's a CFA charter holder, he has a master's uh, degree in finance from WITS, and he oversees the management of all, all portfolios, including traditional uh, asset classes like cash, bonds, property and equities, and alternative investments, uh, hedge funds and private markets, um, and, uh, and, and actually a lot more. And my second guest, Rihanna Khan, she's a portfolio manager in the Four Factor team at 91. She's been in this position for three years, uh, but she has been in the industry for more than 12 years and she co-manages the general equity, SA balanced and worldwide flexible strategies. She's a chartered accountant. She has a BCom accounting and a postgraduate diploma in accounting from the University of Cape Town. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and I think many people look at the markets and all they see is volatility. Uh, short term focus, uh, normal retail investors are nervous, they are emotional. And I, I think uh, if we can hear from professional investors, just the way they approach markets, what do they think of current developments? And I think uh, let's start off with um, Rihanna, let's start off with you. Just give us an overview of how you currently look at the market uh, and, and uh, what you regard as noise and, and what you regard as signals of where markets may uh, move to or trend to in the future. Yeah, uh, it, it has been a tough environment for sure. Um, lots of volatility, as you as, as you can imagine. Um, we, we're sitting with a backdrop where you know we have higher interest rates, declining liquidity in global markets, and then we've been peppered with all these left field events and challenges. So we had the Russia-Ukraine war. We had um, our our own regulations allowing us to go 45% offshore. We've had um, China stimulating, but then they're locking down. We've had UK, the UK with what they call this trustonomics, um, essentially. So, so lots of things to battle through. And I think the reality is if you take a step back and you've got a framework that works in terms of how you make money, what makes a share go up, etc., and you stick to that framework, volatility actually starts to become a friend. Yes, it's a frustrating thing in the short term in terms of what that volatility actually does to your portfolio, but on a medium term view, it should work out. So if you take a step back in the way we think about the world when managing the SA Equity Fund, for example, is that we think the share price today of that company is telling you what that company is going to earn over the next 12 to 18 months at a reasonable valuation. So if we can get ahead of the curve and know what that company is going to earn um, ahead of market forecast, for example, so the market forecast come to earn 5% earnings growth, we think that number is 10, we'll then own that company. So when you hit with this volatility, what tends to happen, volatility is usually sentiment driven. That share price then falls, and then we take advantage of that because as long as our conviction that those earnings numbers are going to be delivered is still intact, that stock actually looks more um, more interesting and will actually start to top up on that position. So what we're trying to do here is actually use turn volatility of the market into a friend in terms of using those dislocations. It is frustrating. It does hurt short-term performance, but we do believe that if we continue to do that, we'll make back that money and, and, and more. Mm. Senzo, what do you regard as noise and uh, those signals everybody's looking for 
to, to maybe give you an insight of what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, I can thank you for the opportunity. Um, you've already introduced as a person who works for a multi-manager, so maybe I need to give a bit of background just to get means so everybody understand. So as a manager, we actually buy stocks directly. We actually support other managers, which we rate according to our process. So we actually will do uh, manager research and uh, on those that we think that on the balance of probability they're going to up, up, over the long term. So I'm a bit of a an advocate position because I see everybody in the market what they're doing. And in this volatile environment, as you as we already alluded, to, I mean the the returns even on the JSE um, a year to date are single digits. I think they are around about five percent this rate. So how are we actually managing that to ensure that we diversify across managers based on their different skills? Some managers would give you like a high beta, so they are appropriate for a market that is actually going up this year. When we do our manager research, all managers that we have actually uh, classified as managers that can manage volatility using derivatives, as we'll appreciate the um, interest rates uh, have been ticking up year to date, which means that it's available to uh, buy protection. So the managers in our at, at our pool who, in a balance of probability, are very good at buying protection at making sure that they uh, buy defensive stocks uh, depending on uh, their uh, process and philosophy. In our world, that's where we actually uh, been seeing a lot of um, what you call value. But again, uh, given that I'm a multi-manager, I also ha manage hedge funds. Um, if you look at um, returns year to date, um, uh, hedge funds are the only asset class amongst the few that have actually performed uh, inflation uh, this year. Inflation, give or take, is giving you about 6.7. We've had hedge funds giving you close to 8, 10% as a multi manager, but there are single strategies within the hedge funds that have, um, have, have delivered uh, higher uh, than that and lower than that. So, in my world, it's more making sure that in my portfolio construction within the multi manager framework, I have enough defense. And also, I have enough uh, exposure to what you call the managers that can uh, they do pride themselves as uh, people who manage volatility. Rihanna, you used a very interesting term: make volatility your friend. Now, many people, uh, when they get their statement, you know, some people daily, other people monthly, other people uh, quarterly, uh, and and they see there's a uh, a reduction in value, uh, sometimes a significant uh, reduction in value, you become really emotional and you become concerned. Um, and that is a, a difficult thing to manage, uh, I would assume, not only for, for retail investors, but also for professional investors. Uh, we don't want to see red numbers. Um, so just expand a bit on make volatility your friend. How should you re look at it? in uh, the context of, uh, you know, obviously when things are volatile and, and, and share prices go up, you're very happy, but when it goes down, uh, it's not always that easy to, to be comfortable. No, for sure, um, and that's a valid point, but I think what, what we always have to remember is that they always cycle that play, you know, you get the bottom of a cycle, you get the peak of a cycle, and, and, and that those broader cycles happen all the time, and so we've got to take a step back, understand that, that it is a cycle, this too shall pass, where are we in the cycle, and take advantage of those businesses and companies, or in a balanced fund portfolio, have some dry powder if you need to, um, in terms of being able to take advantage of the opportunities when they be become available. But the starting point here is that there are business cycles and, and they have to happen. And then you've got market cycles that cycle around that. So it's important to actually take a step back and think about that. Then the second part is it, it, it really is about sticking to your knitting um, and being disciplined. Because the reality is if you start to change your mind because it starts to fall, um, you can get yourself turned in, inside out. Because now you land up selling the share, it's down 15%. Um, and then, you know only to find out that a couple of weeks later the company reports their numbers, things are going well, and the share takes off again. So you don't want to get yourself into that position. You want to actually get yourself anchors in terms of understanding what do I what do I think is going to be a plausible outcome over the next 12 to 18 months for this business at a reasonable valuation? And so as the share is falling and, and that conviction on the earnings is still in place, 
you then want to top up that particular company because you know that it will, you know, it will come through um, on, a, a, on a 12 to 18 month view. And then the same thing on the flip side, you know, it might be read for a reason. So one of the lessons that I've, like one learns with investing is sometimes you, your first loss is your best loss. And so you have an, a brilliant idea that you put in the portfolio. These are the earnings that you think the company is going to make. And something happens and, and it derails that investment case. The worst thing to do is to actually, you know, it falls a little bit and now you, you talk yourself into holding on to that position. Um, the reality is it's not ticking the boxes that, it tick, like, that, that you needed to invest in it in the first place. So actually, you know, your first loss is your best loss. Actually, just, 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 uh, you know, remove that from the portfolio and rather allocate to those names that you have higher conviction in. So it's not easy. I'm making you saying volatility as a friend. It's been a tough year. I mean, if you if you just take a step back, I mean, with this backdrop, it's the first time in developed markets. It's one of four years where bonds and equities are both down double digits for the year. The uh, one of four years in the last hundred years. So we are talking about an environment that's been really tough from a developed market perspective. And South Africa in that context has actually stood out relatively well um, because we actually are, are positive in terms of, of, of returns um, at the moment. So there are opportunities, but one has to be disciplined, stick to your knitting, don't get, get caught up in, 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 in the market dynamics. But how much um, cognizance or how much of the valuations we are currently seeing are actually attached to fundamental analyses? Because, uh, you know, many companies is worth X and tomorrow it's worth X minus 3%. Um, it seems like there's a nervousness currently where valuations are based on, on a lot more than core valuations. Um, a lot of emotion in the market and most of the trading taking place comes from professional investors. So how critical is fundamental analysis currently with, uh, you know, in reference to, to market valuations? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Because, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, as you appreciate, I see a lot of asset managers, including Rihanna, I actually know him. Um, so if you look at the drivers of asset prices, fundamentals is one of them, valuation is one of them. But what we have said is that most of the managers are cognizant of what is happening in terms of the macros. I mean, the first a thing that uh, Rihanna uh, spoke about was the headwinds that we are we are facing. We cannot just make uh, investment uh, decision in isolation. You need to actually take it, uh, cognizant of what the um, uh, macro uh, is, is happening on the macro front. You also take uh, a cognizant of, of, of the catalyst that, has, that is go actually going to make your investment um, uh, what to call uh, be um, uh, the drivers, the, uh, uh, the catalyst that is going to take your investment uh, forward, including the sentiment as well so it is important that the that we appreciate that even though market goes through cycles there are cycles where sentiments or momentum or macros are actually driving the what you call the uh, the, the asset price like this year I mean if Ukraine and uh, and, and Russia were to uh, call it truce you will see that the, the market would react very differently as compared to where uh, you don't actually see any end in sight Example again that I can give you is that at 3 p.m. today, China is going to give us an update on their COVID policy, given the unrest that has been happening um, over, over, over the weekend. That has actually made and propelled the market uh, this morning because the market is looking for guidance. And the narrow leadership that we have been seeing uh, over the past, uh, what you call, year or so, where you're seeing energy being, uh, what you call, a proper team uh, uh, and, and a bit of, uh, what you call, financials and banks uh, being a team where if you are not on those two, uh, what you call, sectors, in the balance of probability, you have actually underperformed. Then over to you, Rihanna. Rihanna? Yes, sorry. Um, but just, just, just on the valuations and, and, and how much, uh, you know, currently we are seeing that valuations are based on fundamentals. Um, it seems to be a bit just disjointed. Yeah, no, look, I mean, you, you've got to separate the two um, because, you know, I, I think at, at the core of what you do, if we're keeping fundamentals and we know what, what's going on there, we, we, we've got a good steer. But the reality is that volatility that you're experiencing markets is the valuation moving around because that's the other part of it. So you make your returns from earnings, dividends, and then the, the multiple moving around. And I think the key here with the, with the multiple moving around is 
there, there are opportunities that come from that, right? So it's not just long only participants like myself that are involved in, in, in markets and global markets in particular. You've got these guys that are playing there. The hedge fund industry has grown. There's lots of leveraged products, um, you know, that have gained traction that causes these shares to move in, in you know, in, 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 in multiple directions in a much more aggressive manner. You've got these guys where um, passive investing, for example, where guys buy baskets of stock. So instead of buy, like your retailer, is in potentially the one outperforming the other, you get these moments where they're all just moving in sync together. Um, you know, and, and so there are all these these dynamics at play. And and for us, we know all those things are going on, but it's to take a step back and say, is there an opportunity here? If all those three retailers have gone up in the same direction, but I only actually think the one's doing well, and I own the other one, but it, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit nervous about that one. It gives me an opportunity to actually, you know, sell down that. So for us, it's about understanding the marketplace, knowing that there are all these people that are playing there. Forgot to mention all the systematic traders where you know they program things into computers and what lands up happening is you know a, a news headline comes out and these things automatically trade so it causes the volatility so we just sit there silently doing what we do on a daily basis sticking to our knitting and we take a try and take advantage of those of those dislocations um, because the reality is that that multiple is moving around but we have to also have a steer in terms of what we think is is fair for for that particular company so I give an example with the South African banks you know, if you if you draw a line, like they've done really well year to date, but in between that, they've been going up and down. And so what we've been doing is, because our forecasts are above market consensus for a lot of the South African banks, every time they've dipped lower, we've topped up our positions in, in those particular counters. Um, so that's just the discipline in terms of sitting there um, having high conviction in terms of the fundamentals and taking, taking advantage of, of, of the volatility. Uh, Senzo, interesting question from Sir Cassio, and it uh, is uh, as reference to what you've said earlier. Um, and Sir Cassio, interesting name, uh, asks, uh, what kind of derivative instruments are traded in the hedge funds that you refer to, especially those that beat inflation? So it's not just only just derivative. The nice thing about our South African in, uh, hedge fund industry is that um, it's, it's regulated of late. I think there was a regulation, but uh, this is 52 that was introduced around um, uh, 2017, 2018, where it actually gives you guidance as to what you can do and what you cannot do. When I'm talking about derivative, remember with hedge funds, you can make money with, for, with the share that is going higher or up. And we can also make a money when the share is going down by shorting. So, and there, and and in addition to that, they are not only um, can only their universe is local and global. So, what they've been doing is that uh, in in times where the the VIX or the the, the, the volatility has been elevated, you will see them hedging. The, the, the market, whether it's via uh, zero cost callers or depending on the style of the manager, sometimes they use forwards and futures, whether locally and globally. But these guys can, uh, what you call, make money um, with uh, what you call both markets going up or down. So, hence, uh, this year to date, they've actually managed most of them to actually give you close to about 8 to 10 percent on the multi management fund. Uh, Senta, staying with you, within this, these volatile markets we are currently seeing, mm. should hedge funds be uh, in your portfolio? Should you look at that as an alternative to try and uh, you know, mitigate some of the risks? They are meant for that. If you manage a hedge fund that is trying to achieve a certain objective, most of them have various objectives. But hedge funds do well in a volatile environment, given the tools that they have at disposal. As I said, they can make money out of a share going down from 100 to 50. They can profit out of that. They can also make money out of a share uh, if they are long it, uh, moving from 100 to uh, 200. So they, they have uh, what you call uh, 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 return asymmetry in that case, depending on their stock selection uh, uh, capability. So it's the, a very good environment um, for hedge funds, given that uh, what, what, what I've already said is the VIX, uh, by, uh, by the way, uh, uh, for retail investors, VIX is um, freely available on the internet. You can just call Google and type in VIX. It gives you the expected volatility of um, uh, the, the, the uh, S&P 500 stocks or the U.S. stocks over the next 30 days. 
So how you would interpret that is that if it's less than 20, it means that the volatility is, uh, the fear is, uh, is, is, is not in the market, so there's a bit of stability. Above 30, it means that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. And in between 20 and 30, the market is undecided. And you see, if you go on Google right now and type in VIX, you can actually track it over time. When there's a lot of uncertainty, it actually spikes up. So you don't have to guess whether we're in a volatile environment or not. But hedge funds were meant for that. And in South Africa, remember, they are regulated now. So there's a lot of uh, what you call risk parameters that they have to abide. Uh, by uh, 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 in line with the what to call the retail investor uh, hedge fund uh, regulation. Rihanna, you're a long only investor. Do you agree with that? It definitely has a role to play. I guess when you when you have a balanced fund, uh, for example, which is what Sins is alluding to, uh, we are allowed to actually take take positions like that within the hedge fund. So we've got a hedge fund uh, position, a small one, um, inside our balanced funds from from our existing team um, that, that sits there. Um, also, in terms of a balanced fund, if you if you or if you if you're unable to to um, actually allocate to hedge funds, I guess the reality is there. The alternative is to just make sure you've got some dry powder to be able to allocate um, when the market does turn on you, um, so that you know you can take advantage of the opportunity. So, a one parking place for sure. I think hedge funds is a is, is a very neat uh, solution in terms of managing managing through the through the volatility, um, and also having some some dry powder available. But did you change the, the frequency of trading and uh, the changing of positions um, within the past few years since we've seen this uh, increase in volatility? Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question. Um, and I think it's a case-by-case case basis, right? Because I mean, we are active managers and we react to information. And you know, if that information impacts our earnings, then for sure we, we're going to change our mind. Um, so, for example, there was like, um, for example, Richmond is a company that we that we own over the course of last year, and we almost exited the position in February this year because we had felt that the the, the stock had moved way beyond what we felt the earnings um, earnings were going to do for that business. Subsequently, the market got concerned, the stock fell quite heavily over the following six months. Um, earnings started to look a little bit better in terms of risk reward versus our analyst forecast, and we've actually gone back into Richmond, um, you know, like a month and a half ago. So, you know, in the space of less than 12 months, we, we almost exited the stock but have gotten back in, but the reality is the share price movements and the earnings movements that we experienced versus our, our, our analyst forecasts actually got us in and out of that position quite nicely. So there are moments where that happens. Um, also, like with the banks example, you know, every time it, it, it tips down, we've been we've been topping those positions up, etc. So we are trying to take advantage of of these opportunities at the margin. But I think you know, as an active manager, you're always doing that. I think probably the time frames are, are a little bit more condensed um, mm. lately. Uh, mm. Is probably the, the fair answer. Senator, I'm going to throw it to you as well. Uh, have you changed the, your trading frequency over the past few years? I, I, it has improved um, given that the asset managers themselves do the heavy lifting for me as a multi manager. So we monitor them a lot. So if 91 is actually do, uh, doing uh, buying the deep or buying in parts of uh, market weakness and I see them picking up um, what you call banks and I see them picking up re retailers. It works into our advantage. So we are a, 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 a leg removed from the buying of stocks. So if you're looking at the uh, asset managers that we hold, yes, you, you, you can see that given that in, in 2022 actually there's a high dispersion in terms of returns. And there's been a lot of uh, what to call part of market weaknesses, and you see them actually actively trading, and also increase the usage of derivatives, especially those uh, protection that I spoke about earlier on, where people are not sure whether the level of markets is actually uh, very correctly, so they will protect against uh, the the downside, so that when it's uh, um, a, a time for the beta. Uh, like we saw in 2021, where there was like 30% return in the market. This year, you, you're not you're not getting that. So uh, essentially, 
from asset manager side, you're seeing it that it the turnover picks up, but it's for the good reason. It's it's not like they are buying, um, they're picking up a lot of the the teams that are, are actually uh, already played up, like the energy. No, you're seeing them picking up uh, with the, the the fallen angels in terms of most of the SAX uh, uh, stocks uh, that we have seen, whether it's, it's education, whether it's retail, or whether it's it's banks as well. Uh, I invite uh, uh, viewers to send questions to events at moneyweb.co.za or type uh, questions in the chat box uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. Please cl uh, keep those questions coming. Uh, interesting question from Sean. Um, and I've heard this uh, question actually a few times. Uh, you know, what, 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 are th what is the role of um, speculators and traders and hedge fund managers um, in the current environment, uh, do they contribute to the volatility we are seeing at the moment? And does that have an impact on your investment decisions? Uh, Rihanna? No, for sure. I think, um, and it's more evident, I think, in global markets. Yes, South Africa has a dose of it. But um, in terms of managing the offshore offshore money inside our global balance funds, you are, are experiencing that on a, on a much larger, larger scale. Um, and I think, you know, as I mentioned before, um, the hedge fund industry and the advent of, of these leveraged products do cause things. Like you'll see a lot of pressure on a particular sector and, you, and, and there's just no news flow or anything. And then all of a sudden that, that can all unwind um, because what lands up happening, especially in the U.S. market, for example, is that the hedge fund guy, if he's doing really well, um, then it's fine. He gets to leverage up those positions, but it reaches a point where if he's doing badly, he gets a tap on the shoulder and he actually has to liquidate all his positions. And, you know, these are, are, are re reasonable amounts of money. So what you land up finding is everything that, that didn't work, he has to unwind all of that and all those shorts get lifted and there's relief in those shares. So there's a lot of that going on. It causes a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of noise in the market, which is why I'll, I'll go back to the fact that we are very earnings focused locally and globally in terms of the way we think about things. And so we have our anchors in terms of what we think the businesses are going to do from an earnings perspective. So we spend a lot more time trying to understand the industry dynamics, the environments these companies are operating in, what's going on, so that we have high conviction around those businesses from a bottom up perspective understand where we are in the cycle and so when these movements actually start to happen like those become opportunities for us because you know in the, the reality is we know that those things don't last long um you know there's pressure it might be pressure for a couple of weeks or whatever the case may be but then it eludes and and, and the fundamentals do come through um but it's, it's it's definitely not not easy and i think with the systematic traders for example they in the u.s have become you know the bulk of the volume that you actually experience there is is through these guys so they become very very um you know, I, I think what lands up happening, and Senza alluded to it, the 20 versus 30 volatility, you know, it, these guys, when the volatility is falling, they're starting to add more, right? And when the volatility is rising, they are selling. So what lands up happening is when volatility is rising, markets are falling. And then these guys are exacerbating the fall in the markets because they're selling into that. And then vice versa, when, when the volatility is going down, markets are rallying and they're adding into that. So they just add these, this extra impetus. So what it does do is, and you have to acknowledge the fact that they are there, is that they will extend your 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 investments to the upside and the downside, and you've got to be disciplined in terms of actually not patting yourself on the back saying, geez, I, I called the stock really while it's doing well. If it's gone ahead of, of what it's meant to be, you've got to actually be disciplined enough to trim it um, and go into those areas that, that you know that, that are more unloved from, from, from the dynamics that are going on in the market. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. You know, when they are... Uh, well, there is extreme volatility, you know, prices tend to go down. But Senta, I want to add to that question. Um, I recently saw a graph um, regarding uh, cryptocurrency where the uh, volatility was measured uh, over the time of day. And it was very, very clear that the moment the U.S. Uh, and, and U.S. investors or uh, traders or speculators wake up, the action starts. Uh, a lot more of the volatility comes from the U.S. and then the whole of the, the, the rest of the world follows suit. Uh, do you also believe that maybe the U.S. Uh, is uh, setting the trend for world markets? Um, and again, I think that uh, uh, plays into the, the previous discussion about valuations. Um, how big an impact do you think the U.S. has on valuations and uh, do you think it's justified? 
So the U.S. as a, an economy and as a market, if you look at what we track in terms of global equity, they are somewhere around 69 to 70 percent of the MSCI world, which already tells you that uh, they are a marginal buyer in the market, in the global market, and that is very important. Uh, a point to say they will actually influence what is actually happening uh, from an asset price. In a balance of probability, we also follow um, the U.S. Uh, unless there are uh, what you call other news that are specific to the South African economy and South African politics and other uh, factors. But the U.S. even how it has evolved from back in the days, um, even uh, how the accessibility of it now. Uh, even the brokerage fees now, I mean, they've come down significantly on the back of the systematic trading or automatic trading, the robo advice that they have implemented. The, the U.S. is a trendsetter in, in, in many uh, aspects when it comes to the financial market. So if you see a dislocation in the market, more often than not, the marginal buyer is actually um, coming from the, the, the U.S. That's why the discipline approach that uh, has been alluded to a couple of times is important to uh, make sure that you stick to your knitting, you stick to your guns, and you follow your process in terms of what you are trying to do. And also be cognizant of the risk budgeting, because every portfolio needs to have a, a risk budget. You, you can, some portfolios have no appetite of losing money some they can lose money uh, so it is it, it's important to balance that because valuation cannot be the only thing that is driving the market sometimes it's just a team that is driving the market demand and supply on all um currently even at the beginning of the year uh, february march has been the most important thing and if you are no, if you do not participate in that uh, um what you call in anything or any uh, share especially in the jsc like your Glencos, your exaros your tungela i mean those are the uh, what you call shares that are up more than 50 percent some are more than 100 percent a year to date on the back of the fact that it's not that they are cheap no it's not valuation but it's a theme that is actually driving the market. And the marginal buyer, by far, is coming from what you call the 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 the, 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 the US. I mean, not so long ago, uh, the <coughs> inflation printout in the US came better than expected. The whole global uh, what you call um, market went up by some four or five percent. Uh, is on one day because the US has actually given an indication that the headwind that we are facing in higher interest rates could at some point come down uh, in, 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 in a sense that they will no longer giving us the jumbo hikes. Probably they are going to give us another jumbo hike in, in December. We, we don't know, given that on the 13th of December, there is um, an inflation uh, print uh, release again. But if that comes out uh, uh, higher than or worse than expected, I can promise you the market is gonna not gonna like it. U.S. falls, uh, what you call um, the JSE falls. But another angle which we haven't touched on in terms of the drivers is actually China. China on MSCI emerging market, which we actually track as well, depending on how you account for Taiwan, could be between 27 and, and 40 percent, and it has the onshore shares and the, uh, what you call the offshore shares. If China opens up the economy, the COVID zero uh, policy and better human rights, and uh, maybe uh, what you call have a better property market because that's what they've been trying to uh, uh, unlock. The whole risk on uh, 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 trade comes through. But in a balance of probability, the ones that have, uh, uh, that are cheap, the ones that have uh, a valuation behind them, they stand to make or to give you uh, a lot more upside than those that have actually been um, uh, uh, that have uh, uh, run their race already. So being on valuation in that sense, when there is a lot of uh, uh, tailwinds that are uh, uh, that, that, that are behind you, mm -hmm. actually helps. But it's not the only driver. Just because the share is cheap can not mean that it's going to be a, a, a re-rate over the next six months. It could stay three to four years being cheap 
and we are waiting there and we are underperforming. So always be, make sure that um, you are pragmatic in your approach. Yeah, classical value trap. And I think uh, many investors uh, struggle to, to understand it fully. And uh, then emotion uh, always uh, influences decisions uh, to get out of a value trap. Uh, um, Rihanna, interesting question. Um, you know, index funds uh, are massive, especially in the US as well. And with volatility, those index funds sometimes need to rebalance uh, quite aggressively. Does that have an, an impact? Yeah, so there, there are various versions of this, right? You've got the index fund dynamic and then the 60-40 balance fund dynamic. So what you land up at month end or quarter end, you know, if markets have done poorly or, or, or well, they have to buy up equities or sell bonds, etc. So those do have shorter term impacts on, on, on markets, but not lo you know, long lasting. So, you know, a week before end of the month, you'll have a fair idea of what the 60-40 balance fund portfolio in the US needs to do to be able to get back to back to its benchmark and sometimes depending on what the circumstances are that can have a you know ha have an impact in terms of the market direction at a point in time but I think the key here is all of these things are leading to one thing and you know I think we've been we've been seduced with this drug of excess liquidity and low interest rates for a very long time and I think all these small things that we're talking about with the systematic traders and the 60-40 portfolios and the rebalancing, we are looking at the edges now. And the reason for that is as you withdraw liquidity from markets, it's, it gets tougher. So returns are harder to come by in terms of what's going on because it's so volatile. And now you start trying to understand all the all nitpicking, all the small things that probably always existed in the past. But because the markets were doing so well and going up in a straight line, you didn't really take notice of them. So I think the key here is, we, you know, the, vo the volatility is happening because we are seeing this withdrawal of liquidity from markets and the low interest rate environment that's kind of now played out because now we've got higher interest rates. And so what that is doing, it's making you have to reassess how you're thinking about the world um, from all these questions which which is fair but also in terms of saying you know with a higher interest in rate environment the businesses that built built their businesses or you bought your house at a certain interest rate with a certain outcome those things are going to be vulnerable in the current environment with with these higher rates etc so all of those things one has to factor in in terms of your your thinking because the world has shifted a little bit um, and so when you think about these index funds and the rebalancing you know it's going to become an active manage, ma manager's dream going forward especially because if we are going to stay in this higher interest rate environment for longer you know those larger stocks in the index are unlikely to be the ones that are going to outperform from an earnings perspective going forward it's going to be the smaller and uh, smaller stocks beneath the surface or the sectors that are smaller that land up taking over from your larger tech names for example over the next decade and then what you're going to find is that these 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 index funds will start to struggle while your active managers because of being able to stock pick and not need to own those particular things because they're large in the index and benefited from that liquidity rush will actually start to come through so the way we're thinking about the world into that that with these interest rates and with the change in liquidity dynamics is that we are in potentially entering a new regime over the next 10 years and that active managers and stock picking is actually going to be you know a, a really good place to be on on on, on the global stage versus before you could have just owned those big tech names and sat back and and, and not had have to think much about about, about a lot of things so, so what you're saying is that uh, index funds actually enhances the traditional stock pickers market uh, and that's where active managers play so it's going to um you see so so what's happened is they've actually been feeding themselves because all the flows have gone to these index funds and what they do is they buy you know like apple for example it just because apple is four four and a half percent of the of the world all country world index apple gets every time money goes into an index fund four and a half percent of that gets given to apple so it feeds on itself the larger stocks get larger the smaller stocks get left behind and so what i'm saying is that because all the money is following these in passive index in investments if you reach a point where you know the, the underlying fundamentals are actually stronger below the surface and it's not sitting in those big tech names anymore which we, which is what we think is going to be the case over the next five years then what's going to happen is those underlying stocks are going to do much better than those index funds and then you're going to you know those index funds will land up chasing those those other ones as they start to get bigger if that makes sense so it's just you know uh, 
yeah, um, a reversal of what we've experienced in the last 10 years, we think is going to happen in the following 10. A very interesting so maybe point. I can weigh in there because um, that plays into my space uh, as a multi manager. Remember, I believe in both index funds, active managers, smart beta, uh, uh, because they all have an environment where they are adding value to the portfolio. So in any portfolio, I am allowed to actually have a smart beta fund or a systematic fund and also an active manager. Because if Rihanna is wrong about the dispersions going forward, I've got this lever in index funds that can actually outperform. If she's right, I also have this lever on active managers that I can use in the fund, in the balance of probability, if I um, what you call have a bias on the active, then I would actually outperform. So it then plays into the multi-management space because then consistency, uh, uh, which is our currency and, uh, and risk management, then it actually defines itself on the back of that. And I do agree, we've seen a lot of um, uh, uh, inflows into um, uh, the, the index funds uh, in uh, over the past 10 years. In actual fact, if you look at them over the past uh, three to five years, the index fund that has been getting a lot of traction has been the ESG factor, which has grown uh, a lot compared to the other index funds, whether they are value, whether they are quality and what have you. But the reality is this argument is what we have in our organization because we believe index funds and active managers can coexist. Well, the question, next question is, uh, how on earth do retail investors make decisions in this environment, even if there are so, because there are so many diverse views from professional investors. Um, uh, this is a very, very complicated market we have uh, at the moment, um, and I foresee it will remain in, in, in this state for, for many years to come. So, Rihanna, you know, there is uh, disagreement amongst uh, professional investors. Do you think there is space for retail investors to actually take calculated decisions, not uh, purely based on fundamentals, uh, but to try and also build a portfolio and pick more winners than losers? Okay, I think everybody's circumstances are different in terms of what the money is going to be used for. Is it money you need to save for a rainy day? Is it money that, you know, you don't need? Um, and you, you know, and, and with that risk appetite comes the dynamic of, of how you're going to invest that money. If it's money that you that you do not want to, that you want to see grow over time, and, you know, I think you need to seek, rather seek professional advice in terms of how to do that, um, which um, managers to actually allocate to, etc., because it is getting tougher at the moment. Um, there's no doubt. It doesn't mean that, you know, you can't have high conviction on a certain stock and, and potentially do well as a, a, a retail investor if you take a punt, etc. So it doesn't mean that that's not possible. But I think what's becoming more important, given the environment that we're going through, and it, and it has been, you know, I started in the markets in 2008, and it's it's been a, a very tricky environment to to manage money for, you know, as a as a professional investor, is that you want a diversified, risk-adjusted portfolio, and to get there, you you, you really need, um, you know, a lot of backup in terms of support, in terms of research and risk management tools, etc., which which are, you know, if you can't lose the money and you're worried about it. Um, I would suggest rather rather get, a, get, get, get advice. Do you think, Rihanna, that the risk profile of investments markets, or investment markets uh, has changed over the past decade or so? Oh, for sure. Um, so it's that whole addiction to that low interest rates and liquidity environment, right? And what that actually did was, I touched on it a little bit, but with low interest rates, what lands up happening is you plan accordingly. So there are lots of businesses today that have been built on low interest rates. And so now when you get an unwind of that, it's going to cause vulnerability in the system. So excess liquidity, what it does is you get um, Kathy Wood, I don't know if you know, she's got this ARC Innovation Fund, invests in a lot of unprofit, unprofitable high growth companies. See what liquidity has done. That particular instrument is down 80% of its peak. You know, with excess liquidity, you've got NFT. So you had the recent news of Justin Bieber, who just in January bought something for $1.3 million, and now he's lost 95% of his money as the liquidity is getting drained because those NFT is a picture of a, a, an eighth that he bought for $1.3 million, and he's lost 90% of his money. And 
now we're also seeing like as you withdraw this liquidity what's happening in the crypto markets it's like dominoes right one of these crypto guys are falling after the next um so there's a lot of things in terms of you know when the tide goes out you see you swimming naked and that and that's the risk that was put into markets you have all these mini bubbles that got created in different spheres um because of the fact that money was abundant Tina, there is no alternative. Guys didn't want to put money in bond markets because yields were zero to one percent. So money was chasing ideas and chasing any growth that was out there. Mm. Market dynamics have now shifted, right? Rates have started to go up. The liquidity is getting withdrawal, which is what, where it comes in terms of our thinking, in terms of the cycle and how things are going to play out on a go-forward basis in terms of where you make money going forward. Because now bond yields are sitting at 4% um, in, in, in developed markets. So it's no longer at zero to one. So it becomes an, an, an option for investors. So I no longer have to, have to pay um, you know, 30 times sales for a company that's not generating cash flow because I'm wanting a return. I can actually just put it into uh, a risk-free asset at, at 4%. Mm. And that just changes the dynamic in terms of the way you think about um, where to put money going forward. Interesting question from Ben regarding our discussion about uh, index funds. Um, does, uh, do you think or do you suggest that there may be a, a bubble developing within the, the index market or that it may have the effect of a bubble you know, in, in the near term? Uh, Senza? Uh, I think bubble is a strong word um, given that Remember, uh, also not all index funds are made the same. Um, when you talk passive 100%, where uh, and maybe um, with time, given that they rebalance, remember they also have rules, like uh, what's called active managers have, have the process, they also have rules. So um, uh, they, the thing self-correct, there's going to be a time where the volatility is actually elevated as we actually expecting over the next six months. But the moment everything and the market get clarity as to what is happening and you get a bit of beta, they are back in play again. Because in a beta-driven environment like 2021, the index funds in the balance of probability will outperform. The active managers, on the other hand, some will outperform, some will underperform given their positioning. So it is a matter of where are we in terms of um, the, the cycle is the dispersions in the market from a cross-sectional volatility or the best performing share minus the uh, the worst performing share high or low in in a, in a case where it's high like this year active managers drive but in a case where you're getting a bit of clarity on the u.s fed interest rate decisions um, if they pivot and say they're not longer gonna hike interest rate they're actually cutting interest rate those index funds could come back and actually perform so bubble is a strong word, and I don't think uh, they are made equally as well because another index fund could be a momentum fund. Guess what the momentum fund is buying of late? It's buying what is running. So it's buying uh, energy stocks, it's buying financial stocks, uh, which have actually done better than others. So if that theme continues, the momentum fund can actually outperform a lot of active uh, uh, managers uh, uh, in, in, the, in, in that space because um, it has the right exposure. So the market will self-correct and there's going to be cycles and that plays very well in the hands of the multi-manager like myself. Yeah, self-correct is also a pretty strong term. Um, but uh, the time is uh, not on our side. Interesting question from Sean again. There are many active managers who are benchmark huggers and uh, they, they have a low tracking error, Rihanna, and yet they charge active management fees. Uh, is, is that a fair comment um, for most uh, asset managers, or is it a focus that you watch the index and, and adapt your strategy uh, accordingly? Look, I think we aim to hold 30 to 35 shares in the portfolio at every, any given time. So when we put high conviction uh, behind names where we have high conviction and vice versa, and when things are uncertain, there will be points in time where you are closer to, to the benchmark when, when there is no high conviction. Um, but whenever there's high conviction, you, you can guarantee that, that, that we've, we've got those positions on in terms of the framework that we've got. Um, I don't know, Senzo is probably in a better position yeah. to talk about other managers. Um, so, Senzo, over to you. Are, yes, yes, you are correct. So when we do our manager research, remember that's 
our speciality. Alex, Alex Forbes, with that manager research, will strive. We question and try and understand the manager's portfolio construction and implementation approach. If you come out and say you're a benchmark hugger, we classify you as one. If you come out and say you are a high conviction, unconstrained uh, asset manager, we also classify you as one and we also compare you with players on there. So there are some managers who say that they are high conviction, but given that we have tools to monitor uh, your active share, your tracking error, and also your, your active position, there is no way that we will not question you. We meet with our managers at least on a quarterly basis, some on a monthly basis. So it is an ongoing monitoring process. And if you are not truthful about your approach, it gets picked up very quickly and decisions get made. Hmm. Rihanna, you, you spoke about uh, you only having around 35 shares in a portfolio. And that brings up the question of uh, portfolio construction. And uh, that's something many retail investors struggle with. You know, how many counters do you need to have in a portfolio? Uh, you know, over diversification is also an issue. How do you approach that uh, portfolio construction? No, that's um, <laughs> uh, it's an interesting question. And I think the key here is when we, you can have high conviction on a particular idea, but markets always keep you humble. Left field events can happen and come out of nowhere and completely knock the wind out of your sails. So to make risk adjusted returns for clients, you, there has to be an element of diversification. So yes, I can hi have high conviction on the South African banks, but I'm not going to put 70% of the portfolio in, in those four particular counters. You know, that, that gets managed through a risk management framework. So before I put on a trade for a particular counter, we've got systems where I can actually see what the impact is on, on the portfolio. Um, and I, so, you know, if I want to take it up to 4%, 5%, whatever the case may be, I can, I can run a dummy portfolio to understand the risk adjust, the, what, what risk I've added to the portfolio. So that we can do from a bottom up perspective, looking at the active share tracking error. And then on the other side of things, we stress test the portfolios from a top down perspective to try and understand have we, from our bottom up conviction, gone and put anything unintended in the portfolio in terms of a macro outcome, you know, because the reality is you, 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 yes, you can have high conviction on something, but you can't bet the farm and put 100% in, into that particular thing. You can lean in the direction, um, and, and so all of those things are in place. So a diversified portfolio is, is key in terms of getting those risk-adjusted returns. Yes, you know, like you can be a superstar and, and get certain things and put four, four shares in your portfolio and do really well. Um, but I must say, experiencing what I have for the last 15 years, markets always keep you hum humble. Um, and, and you cannot predict everything. Left field events do come. We've had many of them over the, over the last 18 months. And in that type of dynamic, you actually want to have some offsets to some of the positions that you've put in place. Yeah, as we've spoken earlier, it's uh, not so easy to pick the winners. Only 25% of uh, companies outperform the index over a certain period. Um, Sencha, just lastly and, and quickly, how do you approach portfolio construction? So for us, as a multi-manager, we have drivers or factors that we believe are going to uh, be rewarded over the long term. So we believe uh, valuations are important. Quality is important. Uh, momentum is important, especially in a small market like South Africa. Um, also, uh, earnings, uh, what you call revision and earnings growth is also important, but more the revision than the growth itself. Um, then small caps as well over the long term in the balance of probability will also outperform. Uh, and a bit of uh, what you call low volatility. You don't want to only have a stock that have a, a high volatility. So. After establishing those five or six factors, we then go out from a manager research point of view and say, how do we then execute uh, based on our uh, uh, um, what you call belief in the process? So we will go out there and look for value managers and value um, smart pizza providers. We go out there and look for momentum managers and momentum smart pizza providers. Yeah. We don't discriminate. Um, quality as well. Then we combine the portfolio, put it in a risk system where we say, okay, given that we want exposure to quality, mm. to um, value, to momentum, 
um, in, 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 in a balance of probability, what are we getting if we combine these managers based on our rain, uh, ratings? Then what we strive for is positive exposure to the factors that we believe are going to be outperforming over the long term. There is a combination of active managers and also a bit of uh, smart beta in an index. Then we have uh, also have a, a cognizant of the macro environment mm. where we run scenarios and say which managers will do well in a high volatile environment like we yeah. find ourselves. Then you can actually uh, um, uh, combine them. So it's a combination of the managers. Senzo, Rihanna, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your insights. Uh, time uh, has uh, caught up with us and uh, thank you for sharing your insights. We'll be back Thanks. after this break and uh, we're looking at investing offshore for returns and residency benefits.